welcome. My name is Jacqueline Barber, and I'm the Executive Director of the University Committee on Human Rights Studies. This is a new university-wide committee whose mission is to bring human rights to the Harvard campus, to stimulate research, to stimulate collaboration across disciplinary fields, and to increase the presence of human rights studies in the curriculum. We also aim to bring individuals, groups, issues concerning human rights problems from uh, the domestic sphere and internationally. Among the many uh, Harvard entities that we have within our committee are the three main human rights programs at Harvard. The human rights program at the law school, the uh, Francois Xavier Banu Center for Health and Human Rights at the School of Public Health, and the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy here at the Kennedy School. There are also people working on human rights issues in the business school, in the divinity school, in the graduate school of education, to name but a few. And so the committee brings together all these different centers of human rights interest and expertise. There are many things the committee has done. I'll just very briefly mention a couple. One is a new program to bring persecuted scholars, scholars at risk, to Harvard for fellowships so that they can have the benefit of the academic environment here for a year away from places of danger where they normally work. We've also organized internships and research grants for students to try to promote interest and activity on human rights. Today is the second event in a year-long lecture series, the theme of which is States, Society, and the Future of Rights. The series addresses the following question. Human rights traditionally has been conceived of as a set of norms and mechanisms for curbing the tyrannical impulses of states, for constraining state power, for preventing governments from torturing or silencing their citizens. In short, we've long thought of human rights as a toolbox for limiting the power of strong states. But more recently, we've also invoked human rights for a different set of contrasting goals, to enlarge the power of states, to fortify weak, failing or failed states, to rebuild devastated societies in the interests of citizens. How do these two contrasting roles for human rights fit together? How effective are they in particular circumstances? When we first conceived of this series last year, we were, of course, particularly preoccupied with the challenge of failing or weak states, the question of rebuilding Afghanistan, the AIDS pandemic in sub-Saharan Africa, the debate about aid versus trade and the human rights development issues. Today, of course, our concerns have shifted we are now primarily all focused on the challenge of curbing the destructive power of states. And of course, at this particular junction, the fora for public debate are critical. As well-meaning and serious people debate whether the long-standing international prohibition on torture should be relaxed in the interests of eliciting potentially life-saving information, and as we confront the prospect of massive human rights suffering and human rights violation on our scale, which I think at the moment is still hard to imagine, and as we witness a shift in the traditional balance between civil liberties and national security, it's hard to think of a time when this sort of forum is more urgently needed. The event today is co-sponsored by the Schlesinger Library at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, by the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for Advanced Research and by the Institute of Politics. A future event in the series will feature Trevor Manuel, the South African Finance Minister, who will talk about the, uh, the relationship between development and human rights in South Africa on April 16th, and I hope you'll join us for that. In the meantime, it is my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Nancy Cott and invite her to introduce our extraordinary speaker today. Professor Cott, a seminal figure in the field of American women's history, is the Carl and Lily Pforzheimer Foundation Director of the Schlesinger Library at the Radcliffe Institute and a professor of history in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. After the speech, Professor Charles Ogletree, the Jesse Clemenko Professor of Law and the Associate Dean for Clinical Programs at Harvard Law School, will moderate the question and answer session. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nancy Cott. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jackie. And I'm really delighted to see you all here today. It's a great honor as well as a pleasure to be able to introduce Angela Davis to deliver this talk, which from the point of view of the Schlesinger Library is uh, our annual Maureen and Robert Rothschild lecture. And I want to thank Mr. and Mrs. Rothschild, who are here today, fortunately, to hear Angela Davis. The Rothschilds have helped us uh, not only fund this lecture, but a lecture every year in the area covering human rights or related social reform issues. Angela Davis is currently a University of California presidential chairholder in African American and Feminist Studies at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Uh, she is a scholar, though her greater renown, I would say, is for her work in her efforts to combat social injustice and inequality. Her political work began when she was still a girl growing up in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1950s. In the 1960s, she studied philosophy with Herbert Marcuse and other great names. And she came to prominence initially in the 1960s as a member and activist with the Black Panther Party and as a member of the Communist Party. Today, she's going to speak to us about prisoners' rights. And this is part of her current work, but it also reflects a long-standing commitment which dates back to her involvement in the campaign to free the Soledad brothers, as they were called, African-American prisoners who were incarcerated in California's Soledad prison. Davis came to national attention when she was charged in connection with a, an abortive escape and kidnapping attempt during the trial of these men, and became a fugitive when a warrant was issued for her arrest. She was discovered on the other coast two weeks later when she was charged with murder and kidnapping. And for 16 months, she herself was a prisoner. Uh, and the subject of a quite extensive international campaign to free Angela Davis. This did lead to her acquittal in 1972, and back then, uh, Ms. Davis used the momentum from that campaign to found an organization called the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, a group that still remains active. I, I myself am a historian, and I remember something else from those years, because it was very important for me and for many other people in the then budding field of women's history. And that's an article that she wrote called The Black Women's Role in the Community of Slaves. This article, if I have the date right, was published in 1971. And it not only was a, a very, very important early statement of the importance of the slave mother's role in sustaining the survival of slave families and of the slave community, that survival which is the core of resistance. Not only did it do this as a published work, but I understood at the time, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, that she actually wrote it in jail. Is that? And that was also astonishing to me. In fact, Angela Davis's work has always been infused with and centered around issues that have to do with women and feminism. This is important in her autobiography, where in her memoir of the Black Panther Party, she talks about issues she had to face as a woman in that group. And it's very central in her um, most recent scholarly book, uh, um, Blues Legacies and Black Feminism, a, um, a, a really fascinating and important inquiry into the lyrics and the logic of three great blues singers, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, and Billie Holiday. Uh, this work, as so much of what Davis has done in a scholarly fashion, was begun to try to document and reveal the voices and the meanings of lives of poor and working class women. And in it, Davis writes, she found much more about feminist themes than she expected to find. In, in fact, her work and her life are wonderful examples of the extent to which feminism is not opposed to but intersected with work uh, against racism and against class injustice and inequality. She's an example of the integration of these 
common social efforts. Uh, Davis is the uh, author, in fact, of far more than the works I've mentioned, of five books, and she's currently working on a comparative study of women's imprisonment in the United States, the Netherlands, and Cuba. And it is uh, about her work and her concerns about prison abolition and um, her critique of the criminal justice system for its racism, and other inequalities that she's going to speak to us today. We're really, really delighted to welcome Angela Davis. First, I'd like to thank Professor Nancy Kopp for the wonderful introduction and uh, Professor Jacqueline Bob, uh, Baba. As well as uh, the sponsoring organizations, the, human, the University Committee on Human Rights, the Schlesinger Library, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African American Research, and the Institute of politics. I think I name them all. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Before I take up the question about which I've been asked to speak this afternoon, I want to acknowledge the danger of this moment. Um, Colin Powell has uh, just spoken in the UN Security Council in an attempt once more to persuade the Council to authorize the use of force against Iraq. I don't know if any of you saw the live coverage of uh, the meeting, but Dominique de Villepin once again has made it very clear that France will not agree to authorize war. <laughs> And I must say that um, it seems that the President of the United States uh, is having a great deal of difficulty engaging the serious issues surrounding this crisis. Uh, yesterday, for example, he repeatedly responded by saying, my job is to protect America. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I quote, I continue the quote, I swore to protect and defend the Constitution. That's what I swore to do. I put my hand on the Bible and took that oath, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, well. <laughs> the last time I was on the East Coast, um, just a little less than three weeks ago, there was an amazing demonstration in uh, New York City. Um, but I have to admit that of the demonstrations in some 600 cities around uh, the world, uh, some, what, 8 million, 9 million people, New York, I think, was the only place where the demonstrators were not allowed to demonstrate, uh, where the, uh, the, the uh, march was not permitted, and people who attended the rally were compelled to stand uh, between police barricades. Uh, so that um, raising the issue of human rights uh, today uh, means that we should consider what the repercussions may be of some of the recent legislation and some of the new developments, uh, the USA Patriot Act uh, and other legislation, as well as the creation of um, this body which is called Homeland Security. Uh, uh, and you probably know that a few days ago, the INS, uh, which has not been known for its defense of human rights, um, was formally and ceremoniously abolished. Um, 
uh, to be taken over, whose duties will be taken over by Homeland Security. So, to acknowledge uh, the current moment. I want to devote the majority of my remarks this afternoon to issues surrounding the continued presence in our society of what I believe is an obsolete institution, uh, the prison, and to those abolitionist strategies that might assist us to move beyond an unthinking reliance on the prison. And in that context, perhaps during the question and answer period, during the dialogue, we can ask whether strategies of reform or abolition can best advance human rights agendas uh, in the US. Thus, I want to focus on a particular form of abolitionism, but not without acknowledging that abolitionism has acquired many historical and contemporary meanings. So that in the first part of my remarks, I want to simply evoke other abolitionisms. The most widely recognized abolitionist movement emerged, of course, during the 1830s in the US, and specifically target the, targeted the institution of slavery. Um, this was an abolitionist campaign that eventually achieved a measure of success. Um, I say that it achieved a measure of success because the economic, political, psychological reverberations of slavery outlived its disestablishment. There are other social movements that organized under the rubric of abolition. Abolition 2000, for example, is a global coalition of more than 2,000 organizations in 100 countries whose objective is the definite and unconditional abolition of nuclear weapons. It is, I think, especially important to take seriously this particular abolitionist movement at a time when the Bush administration is attempting to enlarge its arsenal of weapons of mass destruction at the same time as it promulgates the idea that only by waging war against the people of Iraq is it possible to eliminate the threat of such weapons. And parenthetically, I'd like to point out that in this period marked by the imminence of war, military spending is outstripping everything else. The military budget now approaches $400 billion, over half of the discretionary budget for 2003 is devoted to national defense. And this does not even include the Homeland Security uh, Department. The campaign to abolish nuclear weapons has a very long history. As a matter of fact, I remember at the beginning of my own career as a political activist, I participated, I think this was probably one of the largest uh, up until then um, marches I had participated in. It was a march across the George Washington Bridge um, uh, under the slogan, Ban the Bomb, organized by Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy. And that was in the 50s, maybe 59. Uh, unfortunately, this campaign cannot claim the successes that have been achieved by other abolitionist movements. Uh, take the abolitionist movement directed at capital punishment. According to Amnesty International, which is the leading, one of the leading human rights organizations um, in um, the world, over half of all countries in the world have abolished the death penalty either through legislation or in practice. Uh, um, 76 countries and territories have abolished the death penalty for all crimes. Others um, can use the death penalty or retain the right to use it uh, during wartime. Um, and then there are countries that can be considered abolitionists in practice uh, because they have not carried out any executions uh, in many years. So this makes a total of about 111 11 countries which have abolished the death penalty in law or in practice. Um, the 
only country in what we consider the industrialized world that retains the death penalty is, um, <laughs> do, I have to, <laughs> do I have to say what country that is? Uh, and of course, despite uh, the human rights arguments that have uh, been made by many activists, scholars, uh, governments, uh, uh, the U.S. still has some, well, there were 30, about 3,700 people on death rows across the country before Governor uh, Ryan. Uh, decided in leaving office that he would um, um, offer commutations to 167 people and pardons to four people who are, were on uh, death row. I should say that that numerous human rights instruments have been used in order to um, abolitionized, to use a word that had currency during the anti-slavery abolitionist movement. Uh, you know, there were efforts to abolitionize various states by persuading them to abolish slavery. Um, many human rights instruments have been employed. There are quite a number of protocols to, con they, uh, this number, protocol number six to the European Convention on uh, Human Rights. Uh, uh, there is um, the, um, there's, there's an optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, uh, but protocol number 13 to the European Convention on Human Rights provides for the total abolition of the death penalty in all circumstances. Uh, and at this moment, uh, Turkey faces uh, problems uh, with respect to its entrance into the European Union because it uh, has not yet abolished uh, the death penalty. Now, as I said, George Ryan issued these pardons and commutations, and it was, uh, that was really a courageous act. It was really a courageous act. Uh, and I know during uh, this particular period, the lines between Republicans, Democrats, members of other uh, parties can continue to blur, uh, but uh, I must say, this is one Republican I really have an enormous amount of admiration for. Uh, um, um. In most parts of the world, it is taken for granted that whoever is convicted of a serious crime will be sent to prison. Prison is considered an inevitable and permanent feature of our social lives. Unlike the death penalty, which is very much contested, and even those who agree with the idea of capital punishment acknowledge the existence of an enormous global movement in opposition to the death penalty. Um, but most people are quite surprised to hear that there is a prison abolition movement as well. And that, as a matter of fact, this prison abolition movement has a long history, one that dates back to the historical appearance of the prison as the main form of punishment. And furthermore, the prison itself was a product of an abolitionist movement, one that was directed at capital punishment corporal uh, punishment. But early on, some observers noticed the inability of the prison to produce the reformed individuals uh, it claimed to produce and called for its abolition. Early on, um, there were those who noticed the similarities between slavery and imprisonment and attempted to draw connections between those abolitionist movements. The most natural reaction 
is to assume that prison activists, even those who consciously refer to themselves as anti-prison active, activists, are simply trying to ameliorate prison conditions, or perhaps to reform the prison in more fundamental ways. The notion of prison reform um, is so powerful that even those of us who um, um, attempt to represent ourselves as abolitionists are naturally referred to as prison reformers. Uh, I, I should point out that within the United Nations, many human rights instruments have been developed that specifically target prison practice. Uh, uh, for example, there is the 1955 standard minimum rules for the treatment of uh, prison. Uh, prisoners. But there have been others who argue that we have to go beyond the amelioration of prison practice, beyond the creation of what is called in the international human rights uh, community good prison practice. Uh, However, prison abolitionists tend to be dismissed as utopians and idealists whose ideas are unrealistic and impractical uh, uh, at best and at worst mystifying and foolish. This is a measure, it seems to me, of how difficult it is to envision a social order that does not rely on the threat of sequestering people in dreadful places designed to separate them from their communities and their families. The prison is considered so natural and so normal that it is extremely hard to imagine life without it. And so if uh, my remarks this afternoon accomplish anything at all, I hope that it will lead some of you, a few of you at least, or hopefully more, to question your assumptions, our assumptions about uh, the prison. Many people have already reached the conclusion that the death penalty is an outmoded, obsolete form of punishment incompatible with democracies. It is time, I believe, to engage similar kinds of conversations about uh, the prison. And I should say that during my own career as an anti-prison activist, uh, uh, which goes back too many decades for me to remember, um, I have seen the population of US, US prisons increase with such rapidity that today in black, Latino, Native American communities, uh, people have a far greater chance of going to prison than of getting a decent education. When many young people decide to join the military service uh, and end up possibly in Iraq, in order to avoid the inevitability of a stint in prison, it should cause us to wonder whether we should not try to introduce better alternatives. The question of whether the prison has become an obsolete institution has become especially urgent in light of the fact that now there are more than two million people out of a world total of nine million who inhabit US prisons, jails, youth facilities, military prisons, immigrant detention centers. And so are we willing to relegate ever larger numbers of people from racially oppressed communities, from poor communities in general, to an isolated existence marked by authoritarian regimes, violence, disease, technologies of seclusion that often produce severe mental instability? According to a recent study, there may be twice as many people suffering from mental illness who are in jails and prisons than there are in all psychiatric hospitals in the US combined. And organizations like Human Rights Watch have conducted inquiries on incar the incarceration of people with mental disorders and also on the production of mental illness by imprisonment, uh, and especially by the newest version of uh, the prison, the super 
maximum security prison, the super max. Uh, and parenthetically, I should um, say that it is quite disturbing that a new, that a super max prison was opened last May in South Africa, precisely at a moment when South Africa is attempting to build a non-racist, non-sexist, non-homophobic society. Elliot Curie has said that the prison has become a looming presence in our society to an extent unparalleled in our history or that of any other industrial democracy. Short of major wars, mass incarceration has been the most thoroughly implemented government social program of our time. And thinking about this issue, we should ask how it is that so many people, over two million people, could end up in prison without major debates regarding the efficacy of incarceration. When the drive to produce more prisons and incarcerate ever larger numbers of people occurred in the 1980s during what we now call the Reagan era, um, politicians argued that a tough on crime stance, including certain imprisonment and longer sentences, would keep communities free of crime. However, the practice of mass incarceration during that period had little or no effect on official crime rates. In fact, the most obvious pattern was that larger prison populations led not to safer communities, but rather to even larger prison populations. Each new prison spawned yet another new prison. Because of the extent to which prison building and operation began to attract vast amounts of capital from the construction industry to food and health care uh, provision, um, as a matter of fact, some of the same um, companies that provide food for college campuses uh, provide food for prisoners. Uh, on the campus where I teach, uh, uh, students had organized a campaign to, um, to uh, kick Sodexo uh, off campus. Uh, and some of you may be aware of the longer campaign organized by uh, uh, a prison moratorium because Sodexo was the largest uh, shareholder of Corrections Corporation of America. Sodexo divested, but they continue to um, provide food services uh, to prisoners. Uh, uh, fortunately, our uh, chancellor recognized that uh, the sanest thing to do would be to ask Sodexo to leave, uh, which she told us that she's already done. Uh, but in any event, um, the, the attraction of uh, this vast amount of capital to uh, the um, punishment industry uh, recalled for many of us the emergence of the military industrial complex. And so we began to talk about a prison industrial complex. Uh, California, which is where I live, has an amazing history. If, if you look at the way prison construction uh, has produced 33 prisons, the 34th is now under construction at Delano. Uh, the first prison in California, San Quentin, was opened in 1852. Folsom, 1880. Um, between 1880 and 1933, between 1880 and 1933, when a facility for women was opened in Tehachapi, there was not a single new prison constructed. In 1952, the California Institution for Women opened and Tehachapi became a prison for men. 
In all, between 1852 and 1955, over 100 years, nine prisons were constructed in California. During the 1980s, nine prisons, including uh, new prisons for women, were opened between the years of 1984 and, and 1989. So that's the same number of prisons. It took over 100 years to construct, were produced within five years. Uh, and during the 1990s, 12 new prisons were opened, two more for women. Um, since seven years ago, the a new prison for women was opened, and according to its mission statement, it provides 19, 1,980 women's beds for California's overcrowded prison system. That is its official mission statement. 1,980 women's beds for California's overcrowded prison system. However, in 2002, there were 3,570 prisoners, and the two other women's prisons were equally um, crowded. Now, now I, I, I presented this brief narrative of what I call the prisonization of the California landscape. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, an artist by the name of Sando Burke was inspired by the colonizing of the landscape by prisons to produce a series of 33, 33 prisons, 33 landscape paintings of these institutions and their surroundings. Uh, they're collected in his book, which is called Incarcerated, Visions of California in the 21st Century. But my question is, why were people so quick to assume that locking away an increasingly large proportion of the US population would help those who live in the free world to feel safer and more secure? Why do people, why do prisons um, tend to make people think that their own rights and liberties are more secure than they would be if prisons did not exist. And I think this goes to the role that prison plays, that the prison plays in our particular conceptions of democracy. Um, and perhaps we can continue this uh, conversation after I um, finish my remarks. I was told at the very last minute that I should speak 20 minutes. And I said, well, I plan to speak 45 minutes. Uh, and I, so I'm trying to uh, move rapidly through my notes. And it is now about 22. How long have I been speaking, Jacqueline? I forgot to sense. Oh, about 25 minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, then, then, then I will. Uh, <laughs> then I will refer to another scholar activist uh, whose name is uh, uh, Ruth Gilmore who describes the expansion of uh, prisons, her work is specifically on California, as a, quote, geographical solution to socioeconomic problems. Uh, her analysis of the prison industrial complex in California describes these developments as a response to surpluses of capital, land, labor, and state capacity. California's new prisons, she writes, are sited on devalued rural land, most, in fact, on formerly irrigated agricultural areas. The state bought land sold by big landowners, and the state assured the small depressed towns, now shadowed by prisons, that new recession-proof, non-polluting industry would jumpstart local redevelopment. And interestingly, the Sentencing Project just issued a report just a couple of days ago on this issue of uh, the colonization of rural areas of the country by uh, prisons. 
As Wilson points out, neither the jobs nor the more general economic revitalization promised by prisons has occurred. At the same time, this promise of progress helps us to understand why the legislature and California's voters decided to approve the construction of all of these new prisons. People wanted to believe that prisons would not only reduce crime, but that they would provide jobs and that they would stimulate economic development in out-of-the-way places. So at bottom, this question remains, why do we take prison for granted? While a relatively small proportion of the population has ever directly experienced life inside prison, although this is not true for black and Latino communities, neither is it true for Native Americans nor certain Asian American communities. But among those people who must regrettably accept prison sentences, especially for young people, as an ordinary dimension of community life, it is hardly acceptable uh, even there to engage serious public discussions about prison life or radical alternatives to prison. It is as if prison were an inevitable fact of life, like birth and death. People take prisons for granted. It is difficult to imagine life without them. But at the same time, there is a reluctance to face the realities hidden within them. There is a fear of thinking about what happens inside them. Thus, the prison is present in our lives, and at the same time, it is absent from our lives. To think about this simultaneous presence and absence is to acknowledge the part played by ideology in shaping the way we interact with our social surroundings. We take prisons for granted, but we are often afraid to face the realities they produce. After all, no one wants to go to prison because it would be too agonizing to cope with the possibility that anyone, including ourselves, could become a prisoner. We tend to think of the prison as disconnected from our own lives. This is even true for some of us women and men who have already experienced imprisonment. So we thus think about imprisonment as a fate reserved for others, a fate reserved for the evil doers, to use a term recently popularized uh, by George W. Bush. Because of the persistent power of racism, criminals, evildoers are in the collective imagination fantasized by, fantasized as people of color. The prison thus functions ideologically as an abstract site into which undesirables are deposited, making them vulnerable to human rights abuses and relieving us of the responsibility of thinking about the real issues afflicting those communities from which prisoners are drawn in such disproportionate numbers. This is the ideological work that prison performs. It relieves us of the responsibility of seriously engaging with the problems of our society, especially those produced by racism, especially those produced by global capitalism. And I should point out um, that the structure of human rights, rights discourse centralizes the individual, the individual as the bearer of rights. How do we talk about groups? How do we talk about structural violence? How do we talk about structural racism? What do we miss if we try to think about prison expansion without addressing larger economic developments? We live in an era of migrating corpor corporations. In order to escape organized labor in this country, higher wages, benefits, corporations roam the world in search of nations providing cheap labor pools. They leave communities in shambles in this country, leaving them prey to the drug trade, destroying the economic basis of these communities, affecting education, social services. This pro process turns the men, women, and children who live in these damaged communities into perfect candidates for prison. And a similar process happens in those countries in the southern region. Uh, 
a process that often leads people from those countries to immigrate to the US in search of a better life. Uh, so that there's this very intimate connection between people who end up going to prison in uh, the US and people from countries from the southern region of the world who migrate here in search of a better life and often end up in INS detention centers. Uh, um. Why is uh, there such an obvious level of, of comfort with the prospect of so many prisons uh, and, and the prospect of ever larger numbers of people going to prison? The Supreme Court just upheld three strikes. Uh, when was that, two days ago? Uh, um, why has there been no great outcry. Why do people feel so comfortable with the continued existence of this institution in a society which likes to call itself democratic? A partial answer to this has to do with the way in which we consume media images of the prison, even as the realities of imprisonment are hidden from almost all of those who haven't had the misfortune of doing time. There's, of course, um, Historical films, I Want to Live, Papillon, Cool Hand Luke, Escape from Alcatraz. Uh, but it bears mentioning that television programming has become increasingly saturated with images of, of prisons, documentaries, uh, The Big House, uh, the long running HBO uh, program Oz has persuaded to manage many viewers that they know exactly what goes on inside the male maximum security prison. Um, Skip that. <laughs> and so the prison has become, it seems to me, a key ingredient of our common sense. It is there. It is all around us. We do not question whether it should exist. It has become so much a part of our lives that it requires a great feat of the imagination to imagine life beyond the prison. This is not to dismiss changes that have happened in the last 10 years or so. The emergence of uh, movements, uh, the increasing coverage of uh, problems relating to this expansion of prison population in the popular uh, media. However, over the last few years, the previous absence of critical positions on prison expansion in the political arena has given way to proposals for prison reform. Public discourse has become more flexible, even um, um, Bush, uh, in, when was that, during his um, um, State of the Union address in January? indicated that we need uh, mentors for the children of prisoners. Uh, so even that is an indication of uh, some shift in uh, public discourse. However, while public discourse has become more flexible, flexible the emphasis is almost inevitably on generating the changes that will produce a better prison system. In other words, the same increased flexibility that has allowed for critical discussion of the problems associated with the expansion of prisons nevertheless restricts the discussion to the question of prison reform. And I'm not suggesting that in reforms are not important. They are. The elimination of sexual abuse, uh, for example, a, a major issue investigated by Human Rights Watch uh, in uh, women's prisons, medical neglect in women's prisons. Uh, uh, there, there, there are many reforms that are absolutely necessary. However, um, the problem is to frame those reforms uh, in a way that produces the stultifying idea that nothing lies beyond the prison. 
debates about strategies of decarceration, which should be the focal point of our conversations on the prison crisis, tend to be marginalized when reform takes the center stage. How to make the institution better, rather than how to get people out of the institution. The most immediate question, it seems to me, is how to prevent the further expansion of prison populations, how to bring as many imprisoned women and men and, and as possible back into what prisoners call the free world. How can we move to decriminalize drug use and the trade in sexual services? How can we take seriously strategies of restorative rather than exclusively punitive justice? Effective alternatives involve both the transformation of techniques for addressing crime and of the social and economic conditions that track so many children from poor communities, especially communities of color, into bad schools that look more like uh, juvenile detention centers than they look like schools, then into the juvenile system, and then into the prison. The most difficult and urgent challenge today, it seems to me, is that of creatively exploring new terrains of justice where the prison no longer serves as our major anchor. And so I want to conclude with a story that I hope will allow us to imagine a kind of justice which is not overdetermined by the prison, by punishment, by penality. Ironically, the borders of this story are created by the prison. It's a story about Australia. Um, uh, about a women's prison organization. They're called Sisters Inside. Uh, the director of that organization, whose name is Debbie Kilroy, just about a week ago received um, the Medal of the Order of Australia. So Debbie, who is a friend of mine, had this idea for creating an organization called Sisters Inside when she was in prison. It is an abolitionist organization. It is one that calls for the elimination of prisons. And at the same time, it challenges the systematic denial of human rights to prisoners. While she was in prison, she conceived of the idea of building such an organization whose leadership would consist of people who are in prison and people who inhabit the free world. But this is the story. When she was herself, she was herself a prisoner. When she was in prison in Brisbane, Australia, her best friend was killed by another prisoner. And as she recounts it, her immediate impulse was vengeance. She wanted to kill Storm, who is the woman who killed uh, Debbie's best friend, whose name was also Deborah. However, after a period of deliberating the consequences of another killing, the cycle of vengeance, she began to work on the idea of this organization, which is called Sisters Inside. Eventually, with the help of other prisoners, amazingly, she was able to reconcile with Storm. Now, Debbie, of course, lives in the free world. She is the director of Sisters Inside, which has an annual budget of a million dollars. She and Storm have become very close friends. And together, they give leadership to what is, I think, the most innovative women's prison organization in, in the world. I recount this story because I believe that it models a very different conception of justice. It may seem extraordinary, because we're not accustomed to believing that it is possible to achieve reconciliation when crimes are done against us. We consider that the majority of the more than two million people in prison have not been convicted of major crimes of violence. Uh, uh, why is it not possible to institutionalize forms of justice that are reparatory, that permit reconciliation between the aggrieved parties? Uh, I mention the story of Sisters Inside because of, it points to a possibility of reconciliation under the most difficult of all imaginable circumstances. When people think about prisons, oftentimes the first thing they mention is the murderers and the rapists. Right. Robin Kelly has suggested in his most recent book, Freedom Dreams, that the imagination may be our most powerful and most revolutionary impulse. Systematic violations of human rights are bound to find a haven 
in the prison as long as we do not challenge the very existence of this institution. Let us learn to take seriously the possibility of imagining the terrain that lies beyond the prison. This is the work of 21st century abolitionism. Thank you. As you gather microphones or some upstairs and downstairs, we'll take questions from Professor uh, Davis. I just want to make two quick points as we get ready. This is a, uh, a moment of, of, of great reflection for me personally. I met Professor Davis when I was a freshman at Stanford, uh, my first semester. She had been arrested and was held in the Women's Detention Center in uh, Santa Clara County, which is right across the street from the Stanford campus. It's a particular lesson for students. Uh, I was worried whether or not I would get through the first semester of college, and she didn't seem worried at all that she was facing uh, a possible death penalty in California. And as I talked to her as the leader of this group, we had a wonderful group organized to raise money for her. Uh, she was still a professor, because I told her we had this great group. It was called the Stanford Students for the Defense of Angela Davis. She said, that's great. Uh, and we told her we'd raise some money and some consciousness. Uh, but she told me, don't focus on me. I will be all right. There's international attention on me. But there are a lot of other people who don't have lawyers, who don't uh, have attention, who are voiceless and faceless in the, in the prison system, in the criminal justice system. And I was a little bit uh, outdone when she told me that we should change our focus, because in those days, we, we had silkscreen t-shirts. <laughs> We'd already made them. So I went back to the Stanford campus that night and told the crew the new t-shirts would say the Stanford students for the defense of Angela Davis and all political prisoners. <laughs> um, the other important thing for me as a lawyer, this case influenced me a great deal as a lawyer. I, I went to law school largely because of this case. Uh, when I was supposed to be uh, sitting in classes of St. Clair, Drake, and other people, I was heading down to San, San Jose to sit in the courtroom. Uh, and in fact, as the jury came back, now the statute of limitations has passed, Angela, you know we had a major event planned because we were certain she was going to be convicted. And what we were planning to do would not have been uh, a happy moment for then Governor Ronald Reagan. We were completely caught off guard having one set of ideas in mind and had to go from a demonstration to a celebration. And it was a celebration when the jury came back not guilty. But the most important thing for me is that she was represented by four common people, uh, led by the great lawyer Howard Moore, uh, Leo Branton, the brother of Wiley Branton, a great civil rights lawyer who worked with Thurgood Marshall, uh, Margaret Burnham, who was a lifelong friend from Alabama and who resigned, resigned from the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund because they refused to represent Professor Davis and Margaret gave up her first job as a lawyer. Uh, to assist uh, in that case. The fourth lawyer, another woman, Dobby Walker. Dobby Walker, yeah, uh, a fabulous team. That, in 1971, was the true dream team. Uh, <laughs> lawyers who made a real difference. So let me take the first question from the top right. And make sure you identify yourself. You, to just turn around, you. Oh. Yep. Identify yourself and make sure you ask a question. Okay. Um, thank you for taking my question. Um, in uh, the book uh, Lockdown America by Christian Parenti, he uh, locates the uh, source of the uh, um, mass incarceration in uh, the need for a social control of the dangerous classes which have uh, arisen out of the deindustrialization of the urban centers. And I was wondering, uh, what do you think of that thesis? And I was wondering, too, if you could relate that to, uh, if, the, if that source is the crisis, how that relates to uh, U.S. imperial conquest in Iraq in terms of a same, not addressing the socioeconomic uh, problems 
here as well as facing the socioeconomic problems abroad and using the militarization of our communities at home as well as militarization abroad. I think you've done a great job <laughs> talking about it. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for raising those issues. Uh, absolutely. I, yeah, I, I, I couldn't say it better myself. <laughs> Top left. Hi, um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm a senior Peace and Justice Studies major at Wellesley. We're very lucky to have you come speak with us last year. I don't know if you remember in October. Thank you for that. Anyway, um, I recently learned about um, an organization or a conference really called ALEC, which I'm not sure exactly what um, it stands for, American Legislative Something Conference. You know what I'm talking about. Okay. And uh, this is a place where um, members such as the uh, Corrections Corporation of America can pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees to literally sit down at a table with legislators from all over the country and write legislation. Um, and so basically my question for you is, what can be done within the system um, towards prison abolition when um, such things like ALEC exist where um, legislation such as three strikes, mandatory sentencing, and uh, I can't remember the name for it, but it's like police, local police departments get a cut of whatever money they recover from um, arrests that they make. I know you know what it's called, but I can't remember the word. Um, but they're able to do that just in order to make sure that they can fill beds in their private prisons, um, just to make sure more people get arrested, more people get sent to prison. And I'm wondering what can be done within the system against something like that when, you know, the people who are fighting don't usually have those kinds of uh, bankrolls, mm -hmm. memberships. <laughs> Well, I think the question you're asking is um, about the potential power of people who tend to feel powerless facing these uh, enormous institutions, uh, um, facing these coalitions between politicians and corporations. Uh, um, and it seems to me that that first we have to become convinced that it is possible to make a change. I, mean, I mentioned Robin Kelly's book. He has a new book called Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Im uh, Imagination, which is an attempt to rethink uh, uh, much of the black movement historically and, and, and today, uh, arguing that um, the Ability to dream is really important. The ability to imagine things uh, other than, to imagine uh, our society as being different from, other than, better than uh, the, the way it is. Now, um, I guess in connection with your question, what can we do, I would want us to talk about the emergence of uh, this new um, anti-war movement. Uh, um, some months ago, people were very despondent. Many activists were despondent because it seemed as if it was not possible to bring people together in the way they should be brought together to challenge the, the war on Iraq. And then, of course, uh, two weeks ago, we saw millions of people, there are all of these debates around the numbers, right? Uh, with, you know, the police says this, uh, the journalists say this. But as a matter of fact, there were between six and nine million people almost simultaneously in the streets of countries uh, uh, in Europe, Africa, Asia, uh, North America. And that, that really should, uh, does that make you feel any better? Does that make, you know, I know. You know, I've been, I've been uh, doing, you know, what some people call activism a very, very long time. And, and uh, I, I have to admit that uh, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, almost three weeks ago, I felt qualitatively different um, from the way I've been, and you know, I'm, I'm the inveterate optimist, uh, right? <laughs> I mean, I always insist that it is possible to do something to uh, make a change. And, 
And uh, Charles was just referring to uh, my case. Uh, how many years ago was that? 30, yeah, 32. 32? Oh, okay, 30, oh, it was 32 years ago, all right. Okay, and um, uh, then, I, you know, Richard Nixon was the president. Um, Ronald Reagan was the governor. And so it really didn't make sense for us to have any hope. It didn't. It made no sense at all. But as a matter of fact, as Charles pointed out there, you know, there was this organizing that happened all over the country, all over the world, and we were able to shift the balance of power. And so I think it's really important now to be aware of that. And yes, there are ever larger numbers of people who are specifically getting involved in abolitionist uh, campaigns. There's the organization that I've been working with for a number of years called Critical Resistance. Uh, Critical Resistance held a conference in 1998, the founding conference, and we, uh, you know, we were like prison activists, the ones who never give up. Uh, and we were hoping that we would bring about 500 people to UC Berkeley for this conference. As it turned out, over 3,000 people showed up. Uh, uh, and then two years later, there was another massive gathering in New York. And in April, April 6, I believe, we're going to the South because we're now organizing um, specifically in the South, which has the worst prisons, the worst history. Uh, as a matter of fact, you go into some of the prisons in the South and you would really think that this was uh, the period in the aftermath of slavery. It feels that way. Uh, I'm not even gonna talk about Texas. I, mean, I can't even get started talking about Texas. But there is uh, an, an enormous amount of work being done. If you're interested, I can give you um, some information uh, regarding how to connect with some of the organizations that are doing work. But thank you for your thank question. Thank you. Question to the right. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Davis. Uh, is it on? Yes. Still uh, my name is Jay Butler. I'm a freshman at Harvard College. I was very interested by your speech. I was just wondering, you seem to argue for the abolition of prisons. I was just wondering what sorts of concrete alternatives you would propose for prisons, especially in the cases of uh, serial murderers and continual sex offenders who have been shown that rehabilitation really does not sort of stop them uh, recommitting. Um, rehabilitation where? In, in terms of sort of treatment programs. Uh, for continual sex offenders? Well, you know, the first thing I would say is that um, my vision of alternatives is much vaster than that. I, I, I see alternatives consisting not of places, different kinds of places to punish people or to sequester people or to separate people. I see alternatives uh, in the form of schools. Uh, it seems to me that education is the major alternative uh, to address the massive numbers of people in prison. One of the problems is that we tend to think about the, um, are you okay up there? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we tend to think about the um, inhabitants of prisoners as being all rapists and murderers. That's why I mentioned that before. That is the first thing that we consider. Why? We have to ask that question. That is also a way of distancing ourselves. It's also a way of, of failing to address the issue of solidarity. You know, how do we feel some kind of human connection with people who are in prison? It's what Bush does with his evildoers. You know, it's what uh, happened during the Maca McCarthy era with communists. Uh, uh, it's what the word terrorist does. So, you know, first I want us to think about uh, uh, these really basic, basic issues. Because one of the problems I have to say is that in the whole history of prison 
uh, reform, and in very good work has been done. But in many instances, it's a kind of um, a missionary relationship is, is uh, established. Let us save these poor, poor people, these poor helpless people. Um, okay, the murderers and the rapists. I can't even think about uh, that in uh, a um, sort of all-embracing framework. People murder for many different reasons. Uh, you know, what do you do with, or people kill for many different reasons. What do you do with the women who have killed abusive uh, partners? who are spending uh, their entire lives in prison as a result. Uh, um, so, you know, I, th I think we have to be a lot more specific, uh, and we have to try to resist this tendency uh, to think about the prison as a place that only um, houses these horrible people whom we want to be separated. Uh, uh, but yeah, you're probably right. There'll be some people uh, who have to be um, perhaps sequestered. But I don't want that to be the first question. That has to be the last question. And if we start with, if we start, uh, with that as the first question, then I don't think we'll get anywhere at all. Does that make sense? Um. Thanks for coming, Professor Davis. My name is Michael Borks, with the Com Committee for Peace and Human Rights in Boston. I want to say back in 1971, as a high school student, at age 17, I did a book review for my high school paper of your book. If they come in the morning, I give it five stars. So. <laughs> um, the question, excellent book. I recommend reading it. Uh, the question I have is, um, I agree with the abolition of prisons, but wouldn't you consider prisons appropriate for war criminals such as George Bush, Donald Rumsfeld, and Dick Cheney? As, as sequestering them out, out of harms, doing more harm to people? Well, I want to try to be uh, principled. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would say that uh, we should uh, reserve the, the possibility of uh, imagining how people like that uh, should be dealt with. Uh, I'm not willing to address that issue right Thank now. That's <laughs> clear enough. Thank you. Okay. We're going to reverse the order. We're going to go here, here, there, and there. Okay. Question here. Okay. Uh, this this uh, question is in spirit of uh, I'm a high school teacher. My name is Antonio, and I teach history. There's actually a few Rinch students back here, so I'm happy that Rinch students actually showed up to this event. So. <laughs> So my question is uh, basically in the spirit of uh, Robin Kelly, uh, I want to know what you think the role of education should be in so socializing a new generation of youth to engage with a truly democratic society and world. And, and that kind of goes basically to what you think the purpose of schooling should be. So. Well, I think you said it. I think education, um, education is um, uh, an, an essential aspect of building a dem you know, I talk about building a democratic society, and I try to use democracy in a different way. Um, you know, perhaps democracy, socialism, uh, but it seems to me that the challenge of education right now is to persuade, um, is to teach young people how to think in less individualistic terms. Uh, it seems to me that education can provide um, a very um, powerful resistance to the seduction of global capitalism. And I'm not saying that, you know, if people get a good education, they won't become capitalists, no. Uh, but how to think outside of that frame. And I think even capitalists have to learn how to think of capitalism as a historical uh, 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 economic institution. It doesn't have to exist forever, just as we take prison for granted. I mean, that's another lecture, right, <laughs> about taking capitalism for granted. But I, I do think that, um, that a very important role that education can play is to unhook the notion of democracy and capitalism. 
So how do we think about democracy beyond capitalism? Thanks. Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Iyad Latif. I'm a Middle Eastern Studies and Political Science double major at UC Berkeley. And um, on the topic of the universality of human rights, and as the United States is po uh, poised for a war on Iraq, um, Saddam Hussein stands charged with a myriad of human rights abuses, including transfer population, expropriation of land, illegal torture, house demolition, target assassinations, ethnic cleansing, to only name the most outrageous. Mm -hmm. Israel has committed every single one of these human rights abuses against the Palestinians. And the United States has said nothing. They've also, they, while breaking 70, over 70 UN resolutions, why does the United States say nothing? Well, I think we know, <laughs> don't we? I think we know why the, the, that uh, persisting contradiction continues to characterize uh, US foreign policy. Um, the, the issue of uh, human rights violations that, um, um, well, I should first say that uh, the US government has represented itself as the final judge on uh, who respects human rights and who violates human rights. Uh, a lot of those decisions have to do with very material and political relationships uh, and nothing to do with what actually uh, unfolds in the particular country. Of course, um, we could spend the next year detailing human rights violations inside the U.S. that not, are not acknowledged. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it, it seems to me that we also have to talk about issues of, uh, what, oil? I mean, do we want to talk about oil? Do we want to talk about gas? You know, after the uh, attack on Afghanistan, now the pipeline, uh, natural gas pipeline from Turkmenistan going through Afghanistan is now being developed. Uh, uh, there was not the space to talk about this during the attack on Afghanistan. It was all about... Um, Osama bin Laden, whose name is, is evoked once in a while these days. Uh, but you, if you recall, uh, in, in the aftermath of September 11th, uh, Osama bin Laden uh, was the uh, justification for virtually every belligerent uh, measure taken by the US government. But thank you very much for pointing out uh, uh, that uh, contradiction between the way the U.S. addresses Iraq and Israel. Question here on the left. Hi, my name is Gwendolyn Telfair. I hope this comes out right. Um, I was thinking about what you said. I, I had never thought about uh, uh, abolishing uh, prisons altogether. I live in the belly of the beast. I live in Roxbury, and it's it's tough there. And I don't know what kind of mindset we should have the, I mean, the community should have the, when we see these young boys day after day after they dying or out there selling crack, not going to school or anything like that, I want them off the street. I don't know where else to put them besides prison. What kind of alternative there is? Where they live at, they live generally in subsidized housing with their mothers or with, with a woman, and she, in fact, has a, a, a more children, and, and it just keeps going on and on and on, and so, I, I can't see any alternative but prison. Can you help me with this? Well, try to think um, beyond the immediate circumstances. Why is it that there's so many uh, young boys out there uh, involved in crack? Why? Oh. No, I'm asking you a question. Yeah, well, lack of education. If they go to school, they're not going to get much of an ed education. When my son went to school, I just didn't want him to die. So what does that mean? W that means that their alternatives as far as, as their future is, is very limited. 
Yeah, it means that we, yeah, it means that we can't think myopically. Yeah, there are some immediate issues, and I really um, identify with the frustration you feel, and precisely with the fact that there is no place else. And so the default solution is prison. Prison has become a default solution for a whole range of social issues that really can only be dealt with, uh, that can only effectively be dealt with in other ways. Uh, so why don't we have other institutions? You know, why is it, in the state of California recently, uh, you know, we're all confronting this budget crisis. Uh, so every, um, uh, Every major institution was received a budget cutback, with the exception of the prison system. The prison system got an increase. Of course, that has to do with the fact that the largest uh, uh, lobbying body, the most powerful uh, political um, lobbying body in the state, is the guards union. Uh, but uh, but it, it 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 also addresses the fact that uh, this institution serves as the place to deposit people we don't know what to do with. And the people embody the problems we don't know how to solve. So instead of asking, well, what do we do in order to build a more effective educational system? You know, how do we get more resources for schools? How do we attract more people like the, what's your name? Antonio, who is a high school teacher. Uh, you know, how do we attract people who are really compassionate and who are committed to the schools so that the teachers in the schools don't end up treating the kids like they were already in prison, mm -hmm. focusing much more on discipline <laughs> than, than giving, than sharing with them a sense of the joy of learning. You know, one of the things about the, uh, the black liberation movement, the black movement in America that is so uh, important is the degree to which education and liberation have been linked. Uh, uh, and so how, how can these young kids learn to value the process of learning knowledge so that they don't end up, um, you know, on the streets doing, but then, of course, they have to have the economic uh, 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 resources. So what I'm suggesting is that we have to think in larger terms. We can't focus myopically on this um, single, on one single issue as, um, as the final way in which to address these problems. So maybe you should get together with people in your community and uh, figure out how to create a coalition between those who are, do, who are education activists and those who are anti-prison activists. This has been a very uh, important development in many urban areas across the country to link the anti-prison movement with the education movement. And I think that might be a beginning. Thank you very much. Time has expired. I want to allow two questions to be asked with one answer. Just get, get both questions on the table here, and then this last question here, then we'll answer with one answer. Yes, quick question. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Tanaka. I'm a junior at the college. Um, <clears throat> this has kind of been asked, and your response has basically been the, or look to the importance of reconceptualizing prisons within the context of larger society, as it, the mass warehousing of people lie as kind of a, a key, and if we let people out, then lots of other things that are problematic with society would fall down. But I guess my question specifically, though, um, as far as like really seeing the abolition of prisons as a viable possibility, are there any places in the rest of the world that are actually doing things that <clears throat> I understand in the Yukon Territory, um, there's kind of an abolitionist movement that has been embraced by the community and been led by uh, indigenous leaders and stuff. So if you could talk about that. Okay, and a final question here. My name is Meg Gulliver, and I'm a second year public policy student at the Kennedy School. And I agree with you concerning the inhumane treatment of prisoners within jails, houses of corrections, and various other um, penal institutions. However, that notwithstanding, 
if we were to abolish those types of institutions, there are economic ramifications, particularly in, in terms of unemployment. That being from the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons to the cook at the Cook County Jail. How do we deal with that? And I realize it can't be the first consideration when we're thinking of this, but it has to be a consideration along the way. Okay. You're right, there are a lot of people who work in the correction system, many people. Um, but my idea is to build more schools and retrain them, you know, so that instead of being guards, they become teachers, or to develop recreational centers. Uh, and, 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 you know, now uh, there are so few recreational centers available to kids. Create recreational centers all over the country and retrain. You know, some of the guards will really have to be retrained. Uh, <laughs> You know, they can be, and that will be a new job track that will be much more fulfilling, I think. Because guards have a hard time as well. And, you know, in many instances, they refer to themselves as uh, doing time as well. So I think that's a great question. A related issue is the fact that uh, the, the imprisonment of so many people um, hides uh, the impact of unemployment. Uh, you know, there are almost a million black people in prison. What would the unemployment statistics look like if they got counted? Uh, you know, then there's the question of voting and the disenfranchisement of prisoners and former prisoners. And I would, I would suggest that you look at uh, Michael Moore's book, Stupid White Men, um, which has a really excellent uh, analysis of what happened during the 2000 presidential elections. And uh, if the felony disenfranchisement laws had not been in effect, and they especially affect Florida, uh, Alabama, uh, Georgia, where some one third of all of the black men eligible to vote are unable to vote because they uh, are former felons. But of course, during Florida, there was this uh, category possible felons. So, you know, some people couldn't vote because they were possible felons. Uh, um, but yeah, it, 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 thank you. I, I appreciate the fact that you uh, raised that question. And, and I should point out that uh, I think the Sentencing Project and uh, the Institute for uh, Justice, the Justice Policy Institute are conducting a, a vast examination of the impact of felony disenfranchisement. And I know that in the next few months, uh, a movement should be organized, uh, perhaps you'd be interested uh, in getting involved in it. Uh, the other question, um, I would say yes, there have been many experiments um, um, in the past and today, the Netherlands, uh, until recently, uh, had a policy of decarceration. That is to say, their policy involved a diminishing number of people in prison each year. Um, however, since the, the global impact of the U.S. prison uh, construction boom and the rise of this massive global prison industrial complex, that's no longer the case. As a matter of fact, in a number of countries that had um, decent and um, decent policies and as a matter of fact use human rights frameworks for addressing their prison issues. The Netherlands is the one that is perhaps most obvious uh, uh, because they have used the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners uh, in order to shape their prison policy and at the same time previously attempted to decarcerate. That policy is no longer in effect. In New Zealand there are programs of restoration restorative justice. As a matter of fact, restorative justice on a small scale 
uh, is practiced in the U.S. as well, but on a larger scale in Canada, um, among um, particularly with respect to indigenous prisoners, although there have been some problems, particularly in re relation to the fact that these programs are ultimately um, under the auspices of the correctional systems. I think that the challenge is to think about alternatives that do not rely on imprisonment as a, uh, uh, as, as, an, as a default. Uh, uh, because in many of these programs, if you, don't, if, you, if you can't get through the program, you end up going back to prison or going to prison. It seems to me that the decriminalization of drugs should uh, allow us to think about, or prospects for the decriminalization of drugs should allow us to think about very different kinds of institutions to address drug issues. People should not be put in prison because they're doing drugs. As you know, a lot of people do drugs without going to prison, you know? As a matter of fact, you know, I always point out when I speak that we're saturated with these messages about how great drugs are. You know, now there are all of these TV programs, ask your doctor about this, ask your doctor about Zoloft, ask your, you know, and, uh, you know, I point out if you can't ask your doctor, maybe you can find someone else to ask. Uh, so, you know, so there are these, there are these messages that are, that, that are totally contradictory. But I, I think that uh, one thing we do need in this country are drug rehabilitation programs that are free and accessible to everyone. And that would be a major alternative. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a great day. Get all your notes.